welcome to Dr. Spotfire. Learning is not driven by answers, but by questions. And that is why we aim to pick up the questions that you provide us on community that are unanswered and give you step-by-step -step walkthroughs of um, those questions that you may have. For the team, um, I'm Divya Jopi or DJ. I lead the technical content. And then we've got Nanad Save, who heads the strategy and growth. Robert works with all of the post-processing, the summaries, and a few new things that I'm very excited to share with you today. And we've got Anna, who handles everything on the logistics front. Today's featured expert is Kushbu Rapadia, and she's going to be talking about different caching techniques in Spotfire. Dr. Spotfire started in Palo Alto, but we get users from all across the world. And now even our team has grown to a few different time zones. So very excited about that. Thank you. Some standard typical disclosures and Kushbu, over to you. You can get started with today's featured session. Thank you, DJ. Uh, so, So today we'll be looking through uh, what is caching and why do we need it and like how, what are the approaches like to achieve caching in Spotfire, either in web player or analyst. And one more interesting concept we'll be looking about is incremental caching. So caching is basically storing of data in your RAM or in your hard disk. So for better performance while loading your analysis. So the advantages of uh, caching is it will speed up the process of loading your analysis and it will not hit the database every time if anyone opens your analysis, it will pick up the analysis from the cached copy. And one more advantage of caching analysis will uh, against cached data is it will uh, eliminate the load time of ca uh, caching the analysis from the cached data. Some considerations which uh, you need to take care of is uh, you cannot cache. Uh, caching is not recommended when you are using personalized data or on-demand data tables. And when you have a huge, enormous data, at that time also, caching, uh, while caching the complete analysis, you need to take it uh, in mind if you, are, if you want to use in-database connectivity or data on-demand so that um, you can minimize the cache size. You need to also make sure that you have enough disk space or RAM uh, because cache, uh, caching, uh, cached analysis will be saved in your uh, RAM. So when people approach for caching is, uh, when you have a uh, data, like you are importing data from uh, the same information link and that's used across multiple dashboards. And uh, every time anyone or uh, user opens the analysis, every time that information link is hit and it will impact your database because it is reading from the same database. So uh, what you can do is, so in this uh, use case, users go for caching the data. So let's see how we cache data uh, analysis in web player. So starting with the basic approach of caching analysis uh, using schedule updates. So as you all know, you have uh, how you can cache data on web player. You have the option of scheduling and routing where uh, you can simply create the rules You have the option of creating rules and where you can select the analysis file which you want to cache. And so I have already created one analysis. Uh, so let's take another analysis. And yeah, you can, this rule is created and then uh, you can schedule this rule. So, 
when you reload it it will cache your analysis in web player so whenever you open up the analysis on your web player it will instantaneously open it up because it is opening it from your cached version and it's not hitting your database so this is how the analysis gets cached in web player now there's something uh, like when you are caching the analysis some users have personalized data personalized data as in you have data specific to a particular user so say any user who is uh, logging in you want that data uh, only for that specific user so that kind of data is called personalized data so when you are uh, using personalized data in your dashboard you don't need to cache that data so there is an option of uh, deselecting certain tables which you don't want to cache so when you go to your data table properties and say this is my personalized data table so in schedule update option there is an option to uh, deselect this table so whenever your analysis will be cached this table won't get cached so whenever a user opens the analysis uh, this table will be reloaded so the fresh data for that specific user will be reloaded and it won't be from the cached copy so this way you, you can uh, deselect certain tables and uh, one more thing is when this table gets cached so at that time if you are using current user parameter then it will instead of the login username so say right now i have logged in so this is showing my username but if that this table is cached then you will see your scheduled updates because schedule updates uh, loaded this analysis and it was cached in your web player so your schedule update names come in your current user so this is all about scheduled caching schedule update caching there's something called disk caching so disk caching is disabled by default and disk caching is whenever uh, say your web player node uh, undergoes a restart and at that time you you lose your schedule uh, you you lose your caching in your ram so you want your analysis to open up fast so you can retrieve that cache from your disk so uh, you can save the cache in your disk as well so it's not uh, like something it will either get cached in a ram or disk but it acts as a recovery drive you can say so disk caching it's disabled by default so if you uh, and this needs to be enabled on your web player services uh, config file so you see the spotify dxp worker config file so when you export your config files those config files will be in this folder uh, you can say your installation directory tomcat bin config and root folder and where you can locate your web config file so in that config file you will see this option caching settings cache settings enabled by uh, false inside schedule updates so this is for disk caching so this is disabled by uh, default so if you want to enable it uh, you need to change this to true and you need to mention the path where you want to save it on disk your cache and you can uh, there's an even option that uh, you if you don't want to schedule all your uh, analysis in disk you can uncheck certain analysis like you want only say important analysis to be saved on disk so uh, you have this option while creating the schedule if you see there's an option of additional properties so there's an option of allow caching so this is enabled by uh, this is enabled by default so if you don't want this uh, analysis to be scheduled on disk so you can just uncheck it so this uh, this caching will not take place for this analysis so this way you can set up the disk caching and uh, say suppose you have multiple web player nodes and you want to have a shared disk so where i saw you, uh, the path here you need to mention a shared drive path where um, and all the web player nodes should have access to this path so all the web player nodes will access the same uh, copy of your disk cache so this way you can set up the disk caching now this was all about uh, caching analysis on web player now moving on 
uh, caching analysis and analyst. As you know, by default, there is no such feature of caching on Spotify analyst. Like you cannot cache your analysis on analyst. So what you can do in that scenario? So you can cache your data. So how to cache the data on analyst? So let's see. If you have, uh, say suppose just analysis, we'll go by the basic approach. So you all know the basic approach is like embedding your data. So go to embed, uh, data table properties and here you have two options, embedded in analysis or link to source. So if you embed your analysis, embedded in analysis, so the data gets embedded in your DXP. So when you save it, the data is embedded in the DXP. So this is the first approach. The second approach is uh, you can store your data. So while saving the item, you have the data loading settings. And this is available for uh, if there's data table which is linked to source. So World Bank data was linked to source. So we got three options, like store data, always new data, and new data when possible. So we'll select the stored data. So the data will be saved in the analysis, but when you select stored data, your data table uh, options which you have selected over here, that doesn't get changed. So as you say, you have uh, taken data from an SBDF file and then you have done insert rows and many other transformations. And when you select embedded, this gets disabled. You, uh, the link to source options get disabled. And if you want to refresh it, you won't be able to do that. So again, you need to uh, change the settings. But when you select stored data, the options doesn't get disabled and uh, it will always be linked to source. So if you want, you can manually refresh the data. So that's one benefit of uh, using stored data against embedded in analysis. Now you have selected, uh, now you have embedded the data in DXP. Now you want to refresh the data at certain uh, period of time so what to do in that in that scenario automation services comes into picture so what is an automation services so we have a tool automation services job builder from where you can create the jobs for automation services and the automation services need to be downloaded from e-delivery so I already have a job, uh, so let's see. So if you want to refresh the embedded copy, what you can do is keep one copy as link to source. So say this introduction to Spotfire has World Bank table, which is always linked to source. And you can save an analysis to library, uh, which will be an embedded copy. And you can select the option of embed data in analysis. So this will embed your copy. And uh, then, you can schedule this job, like say um, weekly or monthly as per your requirement. So you go in, uh, I have already created one job. You can create it from create task and you can select the triggers, like when you want uh, it to run the schedule and then in actions, It will ask for startup program. So from here, you have to select the folder which you downloaded from e-delivery automation services. You will have this exe file, so which is a client job center exe. So you will have to uh, point this part to exe file. And in the arguments, you can mention Mention the server name and where is the location of the job. If it's on the server, then you have to use this use library path uh, at the end. And if it's just on your uh, machine, then you have to put your uh, machine's path and there's no need to mention anything at the end. So this way you can set up your job and you can run it. So it will create an embedded the uh, analysis and that 
uh, and all the other users can use that analysis and it won't hit your database and it will open up fast because it's embedded. Now, you have a require, say you have a requirement where you have to use the same data across multiple DXPs. So in that scenario, what you can do is you can make use of SBDF file feature, which, uh, which is uh, when you export the data in your library, this data gets exported in an SBDF file format. What is SBDF file? It's a file format which Spotify uses. It's Spotify uh, binary file format. So the SBDF file op gets opened up only in, uh, by using Spotify analyst. So you can see this, these are all SBDFs. You can see this icon that is for SBDF files. So you can, uh, ex uh, you can export your data to SBDF file and uh, you can point your final DXP to that SBDF file. So say suppose uh, this World Bank's data, you exported it in an SBDF file. Now this data table, it is linked to an SBDF file and it, it will get uh, in your, on your web layer, if you refresh this, this dashboard will get refreshed or, uh, very fast because it's linked to your SVDF file and it's not hitting your database. So once the DXP, uh, once you pull the data from your DXP, uh, from a database, save it in an SVDF file in your library and the, your final DXP will be pointing to that SVDF file. So whenever you want to make any changes or you want to use the same data across multiple DXPs, you can just link it up to that particular SVDF file. And even when you want to make changes to your DXP, it will be fast opening up that DXP, which is linked to the SVDF, then opening the DXP, which is loading a uh, data from database. So one thing to note is, uh, the data transfer, there will be some time consumed in data transfer, like opening up the SBDF file in analyst. Uh, that, uh, yeah, so this way, and then when you want to refresh the data, the same approach, you can use the automation services, and in automation services, you can, use the open analysis from library and then you have the option of export data to library so you can select the data table which you want to export and select the path and then schedule this job weekly or as per your requirement so it will refresh the sbdf file and your final dxp will always have the latest data so this is the approach of uh, sbdf file approach So when you are saving uh, the embedded DXP or SBDF file, you need to make sure you have enough space on your library because if you are you have the Spotify application database which has a storage limit of say two GB max, and you are saving a file which is more than two GB, then that will be uh, challenging. You might need to cut down the data or might need to use uh, some other approaches like on demand or in database connectivity. And the other considerations while uh, selecting the approach which you need to make sure uh, will be based on your requirement. So say if you want to use it across multiple dashboards and you can use the SBDF approach and if say you want to make frequent changes to your analysis and your analysis takes one to two hours opening every time so at that time also you can use SBDF approach because if you are opening the dashboard which is connected to SBDF, it won't take that much time, right? So this is about caching data in your analyst. So moving on, now we'll be seeing the caching and information link approach. So most of the users use information link, right? For pulling the data. 
So there might be a case that you want to cache the data which is coming from the information link. So you have the option of caching the data information link as well. And you will find it if you go in information designer and you say you have this information link you want to cache. So if you scroll down, you'll have the caching option where you can select whether you want to cache this or not. If you want to cache this, then you need to mention the timeout, like how much you, for how, much, how many hours you want it to be in cache. And if you want to be based on a validation query, then you need to write, uh, this is optional. So you can, uh, if you want, you can write it a validation query for that. So if any result changes, then again, the cache needs to be refreshed. One thing to be noted is um, there's an attachment manager, which is there on your server. If you go to your server config tool, so there's an attachment manager. So your information link cache gets saved on your server in the Tomcat temp attachment manager folder. So the timeout, cache expression timeout, which you mention over here, and the timeout which you mention in your information link. Uh, so whichever will be shorter, the information link cache will uh, be retained till that time. So say if you are mentioning the cache caching timeout for say two days, whereas uh, in attachment manager your cache expiration time is say one day so the shorter is one day so your uh, information link cache will be retained till one day so after one day it will expire so this are the pre these are the prerequisites for information link caching and yeah, uh, one more thing is the start and the end time of the information link are not captured in uh, action logs. So uh, it will depend on uh, the logs. You will need to go through the, uh, it can be only be retried from the logs, SQL logs or server logs. And for triggering this, you will need to open up the analysis either on uh, analyst or web player and or through automation services because information link like it does not trigger on its own like schedule updates you once you open up the dashboard and if it does not find any cached copy on your spotify server then it will create one so this is how information link caching uh, cache gets created so you open up analysis and it will load data from db at the same time uh, it will cache the analysis, uh, cache the information link. And one uh, few things which you need to consider is when you have personalized information link, information link should not be cached when you have personalized information link or on demand data tables. Even if the uh, information link is cached, say this information link is cached, and you are using this for on-demand data table. So the though it is cached, but in on-demand data table, it won't retrieve it from the cache data. So this is uh, how it is designed. And when you are using multiple spot five servers, when they are in cluster, so IL caching is not recommended at that time because IL caching needs to be done on individual servers individual uh, Spotify servers. And when you are opening the analysis on web player or through automation services, which makes use of the services, then uh, it can cache on either of the Spotify servers. So it won't necessarily go through a particular route. And whenever the Spotify server undergoes a restart, I'll caching, uh, will be lost because it's in the temp folder and it also needs to be redone again. And one, if you are, uh, say this aisle, baseball aisle information link, you are using it across multiple DXPs. So say 10 DXPs, you are using the same information link. Then you need to trigger one DXP at a time 
one the first dxp is scheduled information link cache is generated then you can schedule the rest of the information link if you cache everything all the analysis at the same time then all the analysis will try to cache that information link and it will be a uh, it will be tedious on database end as well as the spot server end so this is all about information link caching now we'll go with, uh, to an interesting concept that's an incremental caching so as you know there's um, no functionality of incremental caching in spotfire like we have in data virtualization tool but to achieve this in spotfire you can use certain workarounds so let's say uh, i have taken here an example of uh, current month data and the historical data so like say you want to always have the current month data refreshed and you want the historical data to be cached always so what you can do in that scenario so like i have created two information links so one will be having only the current month data and uh, another will be having all the historical data and I have put a filter which will differentiate between the data uh, for the current month and the historical now i imported this historical data information link and i created a sbdf file by using export to sb data to library option so here you have export data to library option and then you can export the data in sbdf file format so i exported and created a historical sbdf then i created a dxp where i uh, added that sbdf so you can see i have added this sbdf and then i insert rows from the current information link so now the new dxp which is created has both historical as well as the current month's data so but from your database when you run this dxp every day either in schedule or if anyone opens up this dxp only the current month's data will hit the database because that is coming from an information link whereas the historical data it's coming from an sbdf file so that data is always cached now say month end comes and you want to refresh the historical data so what you will do in that scenario you will create an automation services job which will open up the stored data dxp and you see in that we saw we have an option of export data to library option is there at that time you will export the stored data and you will override this historical data and you will set up this automation job and run this job at the end of every month so what will happen is um, you will have say all the historical historical data plus august month's data and that you are storing it in this historical data at the end of august so when september comes and you run this dxp historical data will have all the data till august plus the current month information link will have data of september so this way only uh, you will only need to refresh the current month's data and not uh, the previous month's data daily so this way you can set up uh, your incremental caching so it's basically this approach where you are, you are putting a uh, c is your dxp and you are adding of a and b and the data from c you are again uh, overwriting it to a so this is how the incremental caching works and this way you can set up uh, different different approaches based on your requirement so that's Krishu, before you yeah before you wrap up uh, excellent session thank you we have a bunch of questions on chat so i'm going to run them by you very quickly if you're able to suggest a solution you or nanad if you're able to suggest a workaround immediately that's great otherwise we can follow up on the doctor spot fire summary pages so just let me know yeah. um the first question is how do we synchronize caching in web player 
with caching the data in TIPCO ADS. We can get the time from ADS and Spotfire when the data load is finished. How can we use it in Spotfire web player caching? Can we trigger web player cache refresh or Spotfire information data refresh based on ADS refresh time? So this uh, directly, you won't be able to do it, but uh, like you need a custom extension sort of thing, which will uh, detect the timings of like ADS. And then based on that, uh, we have a web services UR, uh, URI where uh, we can trigger the schedule updates job based on uh, the external triggers. And that all can be done in that uh, custom code which we write so directly that won't be done but this way it can be done okay um ninad also had a separate answer as a further follow-up on that so i'm going to send you a note with it after the session and if you can give me a write-up i'll include it in the session summary and i'll just point out to folks where they can look see and find all the previous session summaries the second question that I have is that the user is facing an issue where the prompts are very slow in information link. The information link combines four tables with joins and each prompt is supposed to give distinct values for user input selection. The prompts almost take 10 to 15 minutes each to respond. How can the performance be improved? So uh, there's a runtime validation SQL. Is that disabled on your server? Because that needs to be disabled uh, because otherwise it will uh, go through the whole database metadata again and again. Okay, so I think the answer to check if runtime validation, uh, SQL validation is disabled. And if you're confused about where to find that option, please post it on Typical community answers, and an expert will reach out and answer your questions. Um, thank you, Kushbu, for the excellent session. Now we move on to this week's Q and A. So before we get started, just a few pointers about how to get your questions answered. So you can tweet your questions with the hashtag Dr. Spotfire, or you can post your questions to typical community answers section. And I just put a link to that. So that's community.tipco.com slash answers. We are very, very active on that um, forum. You can also contact Dr. Spotfire directly through email by Dr. Spotfire at tipco.com. But if you're sending your question through email, only do that if it has some proprietary data or sensitive information that you don't want to share. Otherwise, the forums are a lot faster and more people access them. A few resources on getting started. There's an excellent compilation of Spotfire analytics resources that shows you what all the different ways of getting help about Spotfire and what the different resources available to you are. And then also the customer success center that is like a newsletter style page that shows you every week what's new, what is the latest content, what are the greatest developments, and so on. Talking about some Dr. Spotfire specific resources. So if you search for Dr. Spotfire uh, at YouTube, you're going to find the YouTube playlist where all the videos are uploaded as soon as they're available, which is usually one or two weeks after the session. And then you can also find us on community. So along with the basic Dr. Spotfire landing page, we've created this excellent session summary page. Actually, this is all Robert Rushenko. So shout out for that great work, Robert. And here you can now see the session written down in text format. You've got the video, you've got the jump timing showing you at what time what was answered. And then you've got a walkthrough of the questions themselves. So if you think that, oh, for example, I wanted to see one session on visualization, 
And you can now just control F and it's going to show you all the different sessions on that. So we're very excited about this page. Give us your feedback. Let us know what other improvements you would like to see on there. So the first question that we have for today is this user wants to show top N values on a bar chart and wants to show everything else as other. So what I've done is I've created a simple bar chart with states and some values associated with the state. Now I'm going to take this expression function and make it a part of the x-axis. And I can do that by clicking on the categorical axis, custom expression, and I delete this and I insert the one that I had written. And that expression, what it basically does is it calculates the rank for my y-axis expression, which is some value, uh, over all of the values of state. And then if that rank is, if that descending rank or inverse order rank is less than or equal to five, then it shows the state name. Otherwise, it just shows the label, the rest. And you can change this label to be something else. You can change this rank, so on and so forth. So when I do that, and let me actually go in again and just change something. So let's give it a descriptive display name. And I do top five. And you can see that I have top five and then I have the rest. So to make it a bit more readable, uh, please use the access controls that are available, they are very, very helpful and they move things pretty quickly. So you can see that I have all of my options laid out as top five and then the one. For some reason I have a sticky key, but I can show you that in another data table as well. The second question that we have today is the user wants the primary y-axis to be reverse order and the secondary y-axis to be normal or in ascending order. Um, Spotfire is built to be very, very intuitive. So immediately from the question, you should sort of get a hint that the answer is going to be in y-axis properties. So over here, I've very simply created a combination chart with multiple axes. So I have two axes and I can go into the properties and show you how I've done that. So in Y axis, you can see I have multiple scales. Now if I scroll down, you see individual scale settings and this is where you can select the scale that you want. So you can select, you know, my primary one is electronic. And now I can change the position, I can reverse it, and I can change my scale range from automatic and set it up. So at the bottom of your y-axis properties, you've got this available. And basically that's what creates the reverse scale on this side and then a positive scale on this side. If at any point you have follow-up questions about the topics that I'm discussing, please post them on chat. I will be picking up questions from chat as well. The next question that I have is very interesting again. So over here, the user wanted to store some CSS code in a hidden text area so that when something changes, and they don't like it, they can always go back and grab um, the previous CSS code that they had saved and use that instead. So let me go ahead and show you some sample, very simple CSS that I have. There are two ways of doing this. One, that I can hide my navigation pane and then control which users are allowed navigation. But that's a little bit tricky approach. So instead of going with the concept of um, hiding or using navigation, I'm going to use the concept of document properties. 
So I'm going to duplicate this visualization. And yeah, this is not a direct solution, but it's a very simple workaround that tends to be quite helpful. So now I'm going to insert property control and let's give it multi line input field. Let's give it the name of hidden CSS. Okay. And I save it, and you can see that I can see my uh, property control over here. One of the hidden features about Spotfire that I don't see enough people using is that you can just resize all of these buttons and all of the inputs quite simply if you just drag it. You don't need to go to the deep settings to do that. Anyways, so now I've pasted my CSS into my document property. And now I can go ahead and close this text area. So I have essentially hidden my document property. But now if I go in and insert that document property, suppose I want to look it up again, then it's as simple as just adding the property as label, selecting my hidden CSS, and okay. And there you go. This one is coming from the CSS and this one is the original one. So as you can see, I lost some indentation. I wanted to point that out. That's one of the caveats. But if you're using any modern editor, you should be able to quite trivially get your indentation back. So this is a really nice workaround on how to create hidden text areas and hidden controls in Spotfire. On this question, um, we internally at Tipo Analytics and Data Science team we use this approach quite often um, to store all kinds of things. So for example, if you want to have a note about DXP versions, or if you want to have a note about authoring information, you know, who the contributors are on this project or what the next steps are, this little text area trick where you can just hide your document property is something that we use all the time to write down notes and dependencies and things like that. So it's quite useful beyond this initial application as well. The next question that we have is creation of graphs in Spotfire. The user wants to create not any graph, but very specifically network analytics. Um, which is used to visualize graph data. So for this, I want to point you to this one um, resource or article that I wrote, and I'm going to send you the link on chat. So if you go to this page, you're going to see that um, it's basically an in-depth review of how would you access graph data, query it, parse it, and visualize it in Spotfire. So the example that I'm taking over here is Neo4j, but you could use any other graph data source which has a driver or a package or an extension available for Spotfire or connectivity through TED, and we have um, packages to check for that. The first thing that you do is install, over here I'm using our new 4 j that's the package. So I install it, and that gives me access to running Cypher query. So I've explained how to pass your Cypher and how to get back the results. But the portion that I want to concentrate on are these four things. You know, how do you display graph data in Spotfire? So Spotfire works with relational data, um, that is rows and columns. Graph data tends to be objects. So when you're bringing back that graph data, parse it into what's called an edge list. 
an edge list is pretty much the standard convention accepted way of um, representing graph data. It usually has nodes from and to, and then you would have the type of relationship encoded as well. So there are four ways to, four major ways to visualize graph data in Spotfire. One is using graph libraries in R. And this is another article that shows you how to um, create R graphics in Spotfire. Then the second method that I'm going to talk about is using network graph visualization, which is what the user has asked for. And I've listed all the resources that you can download and install and test out your setup on. Then we also have an exchange template available for you to look at graph data, but also to do some advanced analytics with it. And that's something I'll be walking through in a little bit of detail just now. And finally, uh, we've got a tutorial on how to create your own network chart using JSWiz and Zoom charts. So this is a step-by-step -step tutorial of um, Zoom charts with JSWiz that ultimately produces a very stylized, highly customizable uh, graph visualization. So definitely check out the page and the solutions on there. And then for now, let's walk through the network visualization, network chart templates that's available on Tipco community slash templates. That's community.tipco.com slash templates. The type of input that it takes is an edge list. So this is from and to, and then you've got size. Size basically just shows the importance of the node. Instead of size, you could have color, you could have line, you could have a few different attributes over here. And then this template aims to show you network connections for this one, crime ring within network visualization. So suppose you have scam or you have fraud happening, then you can immediately zero down on the nodes that are connected to those fraud or spam nodes using this visualization. And once you replace your data, so you replace this tab data table and you replace this data table, it will update these output tables that finally create the network chart. So in the output table, you can see that um, there are a lot of different attributes. So first of all, there's line color, there's line width, and that shows your relationship. But there is also node color and node shape and node filtering. And that actually shows you whether you're looking at that immediate circle of crime or you're looking at the rest of the network. So this is finally what it looks like. It's been created through a lot of excellent JSWiz work by the Indian Analytics team and Andrew Berridge. So shout out and to Anna um, Costa. And you can see that I can pretty much change how I want this to appear depending on what my use case is. So over here, I am interested only in um, the connections. So I go with the cost layout. But suppose I was doing some kind of a parse. If I was doing like a traveling salesman or something that I needed to enumerate, I could do bread first as well. Over here, there's a lot of cyclical connections. That's why it doesn't look um, as good. So going back to this, you can see that we've got the actual crime ring associated in red, and then we've got their highly connected associates or probable ones that we suspect. And they're the ones in yellow and the rest are in green. So you can actually filter down by it. So you can just see what the remainder of the nodes are, or you can see just the crime ring. Now, all of this is highly customized because if I go to edit document properties and scripts, you can see that the script is embedded over here 
and then there are also data functions where you've got again the scripts for uh, the different normalizations so you can go in dig it up add your own customizations make your own changes how you would like to see them happen and yeah this is ready to use as soon as you replace your data table so definitely try it out but before you try it out don't forget to install JSS. Moving on to the next question for today. Um, if there are, Ninad, are there any questions on chat that I should address? Um, I don't think so. I try to take care of uh, some of them around enhancement and stuff. You're good. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, if you do have questions, keep sending them on chat and Q&A, and we'll get to them either in session or in follow-up after the session. So the next question is that the Spotify user is unable to view the add new tables within um, this. So basically, all of this is grayed out for this user. So normally a lot of times the default user has basic sets of permissions but every once in a while when your administrator is restricting certain controls it's very easy to restrict controls that are extremely basic and should be available so you should ask your administrator to provide you access to what i'm going to show you now which is, and this is only going to work for your super users and your administrators, you probably will not have all of these options. So we go to Tools, Administration Manager, Groups and Licenses, and you select the group. So I have a bunch of different groups. Let me see for everyone. And then within everyone, you have, you know, either you can have your LDAP name show up over here. I just have the default all users. And then when I go to licenses, I can see that this bundle is disabled. And that is likely what is causing the error. So if I go in and edit this, and the moment I provide access to the Spotfire Analyst bundle. That's going to give you the option to replace data table or, or open a new file, so on and so forth. Now, I did it for group everyone. You may not have it as group everyone. You may have it as like a slightly different group setup. But basically, this looks like a permissions issue. In case the permissions does not help solve it, I encourage you to start a support case at support.tipco.com and they'll be able to look into the matter in more detail for you. So moving on to the next question. Um, this one is a very interesting question <clears throat> because if you look at you know the wording that the user has chosen which is they were working on the declines of template from community that's also excellent it talks about the decline in production from oil wells or any sort of mining resource and they want to add a slope equal to one line on one of the graphs within that template and the unique thing is that the graph has both the x and the y axis set up as a log scale now the first thing that i want to say is that it sounds like it's a question about the decline curve and that happens a lot of times when users ask their questions on community that they think that it's a template problem or it's a script problem but sometimes it's enough to just explain what you're trying to do. So over here, I did not need to open up the template at all. I was able to create a solution just using a simple visualization. And I'll show you what that is. So right now I've got a scatter plot set up with my X and Y axes. Now, if I go into properties of my X axis, I can make it log scale. 
so you can immediately see that it kind of got normalized a little bit and let's go into lines and curves and this is where i'm going to add a curve of slope 1 so the left hand side of this curve expression is always y so on the right hand side the expression that i'm going to enter is going to be x because that is basically a line of slope 1 if i do x plus 100 that's a line of slope 1 and intercept 100 so let's go ahead and just add y is equal to x and let's give it a custom name which is slope 1 line and then i can go ahead and say that um i want to see my curve name in the label and you can see that it comes at the very bottom over here so if i go in and that is because we are in log scale so if i remove log scale you can see that your slope one line shows up perfectly now what happens to this line if we are in log scale for both x axis and for your y axis so i enable the log scale for both of these axes and you can see that the slope one line still works perfectly so it's still perfectly good to use this line um and that's basically it. that's the solution to have y equal to um x and you can do y equal to sin x you can use some other complex polynomial function like x square or x cube and spotify or just support uh, different expressions in that So um thank you so much for joining Dr. Spotfire that was all we had for today definitely send us your feedback through email or if you have any more follow up questions that we have not been able to address today please post them on community.tipco.com/answers with the hashtag drspotfire have a nice day